World Prophetic Ministry with World Headquarters in Colton, California presents Dr. Howard C. Estep, internationally known Bible scholar and teacher of Bible prophecy for nearly 50 years. To get the most out of Dr. Estep's message, you should have your Bible, notebook, and pencil ready. Prepare yourself now. As America's prophecy preacher, Dr. Howard C. Estep brings a prophetic message that may change the way you look at life. If someone said to you, we are living in the times of the Gentiles, would you know what they're talking about? Say some other fellow came up and said, no, we're living in the fullness of the Gentiles. Would that uh, make any difference? Well, I want to speak to you today on the theme, the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles began about 600 B.C. That's when King Nebuchadnezzar came up to Jerusalem and he sacked the city, destroyed the temple, and then some historians say he took as many as a million prisoners of war back to Babylon. And from 600 B.C. Uh, down to 2000 A.D., 600, down to 2000 A.D., that's a period of about 2,600 years, and we call that the times of the Gentiles or the fullness of the Gentiles. It's an amazing study, and I know that you're going to benefit greatly by this message, and I would suggest that you get your Bible and your notebook and your pencil handy, take these references, and... Uh, this will help you so much to realize that we are now living in the closing days of the church age and the soon coming of Jesus Christ draweth very nigh. Let's read a verse of scripture found in the gospel according to Luke chapter 21 looking at verse 24 and they shall fall by the edge of the sword. Now this they refers to the Israelites. And of all people upon the face of the earth who have suffered tremendous trauma in war and famine and persecution, there's nobody has suffered like the Jews have. They have suffered tremendously. They, the Jews, the Israelites, shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles." It's an amazing thing, but that city of Jerusalem has been the target of the rulers and the warlords of this world through 2,000 years of time. And someone said recently in a little book that I read that more blood had been shed over the city of Jerusalem than all of the wars put together throughout the ages of time. People have suffered in Jerusalem through centuries of time. And that city still stands today, spoken of in the book of Zechariah, as the apple of God's eye. And God has a purpose for Jerusalem, as we'll see as we continue in these various video studies from week to week. And I trust that you'll make these available in your own home library. So what does it say here? Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. In other words, we can look for persecution and we can look for trouble upon the city of Jerusalem from 600 B.C. right down to 2000 A.D. or the second advent or the revelation of Jesus Christ. There's going to be trouble in Jerusalem. Practically every morning when you pick up your paper. I know when I pick up the two copies of the paper that I read each morning, I usually find within the first, second, or third pages a lead story about the Middle East that has a direct relationship to the city of Jerusalem or the country of Israel. It's amazing. The times of the Gentiles is that period of time which began about 600 B.C. when world power passed into the hands of King Nebuchadnezzar. He became the world ruler, King Nebuchadnezzar, about 600 B.C. And it will conclude or be over at the revelation or second advent of Jesus Christ. 
Now that was talking about the uh, times of the Gentiles in Luke 21, 24. Let's go over to the book of Romans written by the Apostle Paul. And there he talks about the fullness of the Gentiles. This is Romans 11, looking at verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant. Paul is talking to Jewish converts in the New Testament church. He's saying, I would not, brethren, or brothers, or fellow brothers, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Now note carefully what he's going to say, that blindness in part is happened to Israel. Blindness, spiritual blindness in the church age has happened to Israel from the time Jesus Christ went on the cross of Calvary and hung there several hours between heaven and earth with some five major wounds in his body. Blindness in part has happened to Israel. That's why they couldn't accept him as their Messiah. Blindness in part. That's why they could not realize that he paid the atonement for Adamic sin. Because blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Now I don't know whether you will agree with what I'm going to say or not. It really doesn't matter. Uh, it won't change the course of world history whether you do or don't. But I believe that blindness in part will continue with Israel until the last Gentile is saved who will be saved. Now God is sovereign and God does not predestinate anybody to go to heaven or some to go to hell, but he gives everybody an opportunity to be saved. And I believe that when the last Gentile is converted to Jesus Christ, then I believe the fullness of the Gentiles will be over. And I believe the appearing of Antichrist will take place approximately at the same hour. And it's very possible that the rapture of the church could take place momentarily when the last Gentile is saved because over in the book of Habakkuk chapter 2, looking at verses 2 through 3, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. God is talking to Habakkuk about the second coming of Christ. And the first coming is some 600 years in the future. And you notice, it is at an appointed time. God has already set the hour for the rapture of the church. And when the fullness of the Gentiles is come in, then God's going to revert back to Israel. And I believe the rapture of the church will take place at that hour. I'm not setting dates. I'm saying that the time has already been appointed according to the book of Habakkuk chapter 2, looking at verses 2 through 3. Now let's continue this section of scripture here in Romans. Until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. The fullness of the Gentiles will end at the second advent of Jesus Christ. The fullness. There will be some Gentiles saved during the tribulation period. If you read the sixth chapter of the book of Revelation, verses 9 through 11, you have there the segment of the martyred saints during the tribulation period. Many of these will be Gentiles. Very few Jews will be converted to Christ during that time because Christ is going to deal with the Jews at the conclusion of of the 70th week because he's going to show them the nail prints in his hands, the spike wounds in his feet. He's going to pull back the garment and show them where the Roman soldier thrust in the spear. And the Bible says when they see him whom they crucified. So he's going to give them a personal testimony of his wounds of execution. I do not believe that there will be many Jews who will be martyred in the tribulation period, the martyred people will be Gentiles who were in the local church, 
who were not raptured at the time of the translation of the church. They saw the error of their way, and they were willing to accept Jesus Christ as their own personal Savior and be martyred for their testimony for him. That's in Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. Now, you see, I'm giving you scripture. That's why I ask you at the beginning of this message to be sure you had your Bible and your notebook and your pencil because these are important scriptures. And I find that there are very few prophetic preachers today who, for some reason or other, fail to put together in a beautiful, simple manner the plan that God has outlined in scripture. And I'm trying to do that on this message that times of the Gentiles. Now notice, there's going to be a national conversion of Israel, as I said a few moments ago, a national conversion. When you turn to Romans chapter 11, verse 26, it says, and so all Israel, this is going to be a national conversion. The Bible says that in the millennial kingdom, at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, that there's going to be sent out people Israelitish spies or Israelitish workers will go out all over the world and they will seek out every Jew upon the face of the earth and all Jews are going to be brought back to Israel. It's marvelous what God has. You see, because God originally said to Abram in the book of Genesis, he said, Abram, I'm going to give you this land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be your God, and your posterity will be as the sand by the seashore and the stars in heaven. Now, God has an obligation to Abram and to the seed of Abraham to keep that land in Israel originally known as the land of Canaan, for an eternal possession. And if God has to keep that for an eternal possession, then wouldn't it uh, stand to reason that he would have to keep an eternal possessor? If he has the possession, then there has to be a possessor. And regardless of what our Arab friends may say, or what the United Nations voices may say, there is no way under the sun that you can eradicate Israel from the land that she now occupies. You can go back to all of the uh, arguments that you want to offer in the United Nations, and you can give all of these uh, excuses that they give and the plans that they come up with, but... God has a plan that supersedes all other plans and the trouble with the plans that are being offered today is that they do not concede or do not fit into God's plan. They must fit into God's plan or they won't work. Absolutely. Man's plans, uh, if they don't uh, communicate God's will, then they won't work. So I'm saying that Israel is going to stay in the land of Canaan, what is now the state of Israel. I do not believe that Israel will ever give up the West Bank. That's the land on the west side of the Jordan River that Israel now occupies. I do not believe that Israel will ever give that up. In fact, I am convinced in my own heart, and I don't say this publicly, and I'm going to ask something of you. Uh, Will you not tell what I'm going to say? Don't tell anybody. Let's keep it a secret. I'm going to ask you to just keep this under our hat. But I really believe that Israel is waiting the opportunity to take over the country of Jordan, the east bank of the Jordan River. I really believe that. Errol Sharon said uh, not too many months ago, uh, making a speech, he said that Jordan belonged to Israel. And he's so true. Because it really does. If you look at an old biblical map of the 12 tribes, you find some of the tribes getting their land on the east bank of the Jordan River, which is in the country of Jordan, the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan, overseen by King Hussein, the little king. It's amazing. 
what this world has to offer. But you know, the key is in the Bible. The key of understanding all of this is in the Bible. Now it says here, relative to the national conversion of Israel, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, capital D, referring to one VIP, Christ, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, national conversion. And this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away, when I, Christ, shall take away their sins. So Christ is coming back at his second advent, at his revelation, to take over the nation of Israel. He's going to put them in their own land, promised to Abram by God in the 12th chapter of Genesis and also in the 17th chapter of Genesis plus the 15th chapter of Genesis plus other places. God says it's going to be a continuing process. I'm going to keep handing it down to your posterity after you. And as long as your posterity do what I tell them to do, I will be their God and they shall remain in the land. There aren't enough soldiers. There aren't enough war machines. There aren't enough Star Wars applications to wrest Israel from the land because if God be for you, who can be against you? Nobody. <laughs> Isn't that marvelous? If God's for you, ishkabibble with the other fellas. They don't mount a snap of your finger. Just a lot of noise, like yelling in a rain barrel. Remember we used to yell down the rain barrel? My mom used to catch her water for her washing of clothes. The water would come off the house into the rain barrel, and in the summer the rain barrel was empty. I mean, we used to go and yell down in the rain barrel. You get an echo, you know. It kind of made us feel big like we were men. Well, that's what the Arabs are doing over there. They're yelling down in the rain barrel. They hear their voices. It sounds great on radio and television, and they really think they're somebody. But God's the one in charge. King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. Let's go over and investigate this in the book of Daniel, chapter 2. King Nebuchadnezzar was a tremendous powerhouse, great king, tremendous wisdom. And he had a dream. And in this dream, uh, he, he saw something that awakened him out of his sleep. And so he awakened, and he rang the bell by his bedside and called uh, his hierarchy in, and he said, fellas, I've had a terrible dream, and evidently he was shaking, and he was upset, and, and uh, he, he said, I can't go back to sleep. And they said, well, uh, tell us the dream. Explain what you saw, and maybe we can help you. And he said, I've forgotten it. I've forgotten the dream. And then he went on for quite a while, and finally he called uh, officially the wise men together, and he said, you tell me the dream and tell me the interpretation. And they said, we can't tell you the interpretation until you tell us the dream. He was backing these boys up in the corner. He was going to slice their heads off with a saber, you know, like that, and no heads. Heads I win and tails you lose. In that case, it's heads I lose. See, he's got them backed up in the corner. Well, notice what happened. This dream, which might seem insignificant to you, uh, plays a tremendous part in the finalization of Bible prophecy in these last days and has a key position relative to the times of the Gentiles. Let's just see what the Bible says. Here we have Daniel coming on the scene. Daniel was one of the one million prisoners taken off to Babylon, 600 B.C., when King Nebuchadnezzar came up to Jerusalem and ransacked the city and emptied the valuables out of the temple and took the prisoners down there. Daniel was one of them, one of the prisoners. So Daniel is called on the scene, and Daniel sees something very important. If you turn in your Bible to the book of Daniel, chapter 2, and we shall look at verse 32 and uh, verse 33. This is Daniel 2, 32, 33. This image head was of fine gold. 
his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Here it is. Daniel's telling him the dream. This image had a head of gold. It had arms of silver. The breast was of brass. The two legs were of iron. And then the feet were part iron and part clay. Do you know something significant? As you go from the top of this image down to the toes, the image loses its strength. At the head, it's gold, most precious of all minerals. Gold then drops down to silver, down to brass, down to iron, down to iron and clay. And most evangelical Bible scholars today believe that we are now living in the toe section, the ten toes on this image. Most scholars believe that we're now living in the toe section of this image and that this toe section is going to play a tremendous part in the closing days of the church age and we're going to see monumental things take place over in the Middle East and in Europe that will play a tremendous part in the fulfillment of Bible prophecy and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice Nebuchadnezzar's head was of gold. Let's go to the interpretation of this. In uh, Daniel 2, looking at verse 37. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven, hath he given into thine hand, and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. Nebuchadnezzar was the most powerful ruler upon the face of the earth at that particular time, about 600 B.C., round figure, about 600, Nebuchadnezzar, the head of gold, the Babylonian Empire. And the Babylonian Empire was very powerful. It reached over the then known world. And then King Nebuchadnezzar had problems, and his son came on the throne, Belshazzar. His son came on the throne, and he gave a party in Babylon, and the party consisted of a, th a thousand of Belshazzar's lords. These are men in high rank of government, and they had their wives and their concubines with them. And Belshazzar built a dining hall that was something like a mile long and a quarter of a mile wide, and a 125 foot high ceiling and he gave that feast on the night of Belshazzar's feast he gave this tremendous feast to all of these people some historians have said as many as a third of a million people were sitting down in frivolity that night in nudity and drunkenness and having a great hilarious time but this head of gold is not going to last forever. No siree. Because whenever this feast was going on under Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son, or grandson actually, when this feast was going on under Belshazzar, the Medes and the Persians, here we have the two arms of silver, the Medes and the Persians came up on the city of Babylon and they stopped the water gate that allowed the water to run down the main street of the city of Babylon, which was the river Euphrates. They stopped the water from running down and they turned the water around the city and then the Medes and the Persian armies marched dry shod down the riverbed of the Euphrates and they stormed in into that dining hall and historians say next morning a third of a million people lay dead in their own blood and Babylon ceased as a world power from that moment on you see God has a way of letting our enemies wipe us out you have to be careful that you don't tantalize God too much or take too much for granted because God may allow your worst enemy to wipe you off the face of the map. 
the Medes and the Persians, the silver. This image was a picture of Gentile world power. From 600 B.C. to 2000 A.D., the revelation of Jesus Christ. So God, through a dream by Nebuchadnezzar, who saw an image which scared the daylights out of him, interpreted by Daniel, the head of gold, the arms of silver, this image is to tell us that we are now living in the closing days of the church age and the soon coming of Jesus Christ is near and we need to do all we can to get our neighbors saved, converted. Medes and Persians didn't rule too long, but they were a world power of lesser importance than the head of gold. And then there came a man on the scene by the name of Alexander the Great, tremendous warrior, Greek, Grecian Empire, brass, the belly of brass. And Alexander conquered the then known world. He conquered from away over here past the country of Greece and Turkey and Iraq and Iran, Saudi Arabia. He went all over into Afghanistan, Pakistan, over into the very threshold of India. King Alexander conquered all of this then known world. And then historians tell us that he sat down on the shores of the Aegean Sea and he wept, a confirmed alcoholic. He wept that there were no more worlds to conquer. And he died a dreadful death. Alcoholism. And naturally, the Alexandrian Empire ceased to exist. It was turned over to four of his generals. And four of his generals later evolved into four different countries. And then out of those four countries came the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is represented in this great image by the two legs. Iron. When you think of an iron horse, you think of a big steam engine. Iron. Iron is uh, something durable. Lasts forever. Iron. Just lasts and lasts and lasts. But the Roman Empire failed. The Roman Empire became very wicked. The Roman Empire gradually went off the scene. And today there is no segment of the Roman Empire existing except a little country like Italy and a few little spot places around the globe that give us a, a reference to the Roman Empire. You see, these kingdoms will never come back into power again. The Roman Empire will never come back. I've heard some preachers say that the Roman Empire is going to be revived. Now, that's not right. It's not going to be revived. It's going to be revised. There's a difference. To revive the Roman Empire, you would have to bring it back as it was in the days of Christ with the capital at Rome and one at Constantinople. But the Roman Empire is not going to be revived. It's going to be revised in the ten-toe confederation of nations, the five toes on the two feet in this image. You see, we have moved from the head right down through the image slowly, down through the silver, down through the brass tummy, down through the iron legs, and now we're moving down into the iron clay. And we have in Europe a number of countries, France, Germany, Italy, Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, United Kingdom, which is England, Denmark, Ireland, Greece, and there's some other countries uh, that may have joined by the time you are watching this uh, sermon on videotape. You see, there has to be 10 nations in Europe. Now, you could have a list of 20 nations, but there would have to be 10 of the 20, or 10 of the 15, or 10 of the 12, whatever it might be. There would have to be 10 that would correspond to the five toes on the two feet making 10 nations. Because those 10 nations are going to do tremendous things in the closing days of the church age. They're going to be a great power for the Antichrist in those days. Absolutely a tremendous power. Let's take a look 
And I want to emphasize this. I didn't emphasize it a few moments ago, but I do want to now. I want to emphasize uh, Daniel 2, 39a. This is the third kingdom. This is Daniel 2, 39, uh, looking at the... Uh, the A part, and after thee shall rise another kingdom in fear to thee, and another third kingdom of brass which shall bear rule over all the earth, the Alexandrian kingdom. Verse 40, and the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Daniel is giving us a reference to this image. The gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, the iron, the clay. He's telling us about it. The thing that makes it so unusually different is the fact that from 600 B.C. right down to 2000 A.D., which is the top of the image, down to the two feet, we have a period of 2,600 years, approximately, round figures, which we call the times of the Gentiles or the fullness of the Gentiles. Once the world moves to the conclusion of this 2000 AD, the revelation of Jesus Christ, then the times of the Gentiles will be over. God's been dealing with the Gentiles for 2,000 years. He'll stop dealing with the Gentiles. There will be a dealing with Israel because God is going to put Israel back in their own land and Israel is going to become the number one nation in all of the world at that time. The Bible says that people in that day will see a man on the street and they'll say, Oh, were you born in Jerusalem? You were? Come over here. Here's a man that was born in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is going to become the most important city in all of the world during the millennial kingdom. And when a man born in Jerusalem goes to some other part of the world, the people will see him and they'll gather around him and they will stand there awestruck as it were. This man was born in Jerusalem. You see, God is going to deal with Israel. He has a plan for them. Absolutely. Now notice these ten toes. In the book of Revelation, something interesting, because I said at the beginning of our message today that this image and eventually these ten toes are going to have a gigantic role to play in the culmination of Bible prophecy in the last days. Now, hear what it has to say. This is Revelation chapter 17, and we're beginning with verse 12. And the ten horns, may I say the ten horns of Revelation 17 are the same as the ten toes of Daniel chapter 2. Same thing. Toes in Daniel, horns in Revelation. A horn means a world power. Here we go. Verse 12 of Revelation 17. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now what this verse of scripture is telling me is that the ten horns, five toes on this foot and five toes on this foot, making a total of ten, these ten toes or ten horns are going to join themselves to the Antichrist. The Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to come into power in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. He's going to receive all of Satan's own power. And the Antichrist is going to get the help, assistance of these ten toes. And this is all in the culmination of the times of the Gentiles. That was verse 12 we read. Notice what it says. These have one mind. In other words, these ten kings, ten rulers, ten prime ministers, 
ten whoever they are at the head of these ten governments, are going to be able to have one mind. They're going to agree. They're going to sit down at a common table and they're going to be able to decide that we're all going to stick together and this is what we're going to do. And shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Very simple. That's as simple as I know how to put it. You're going to have these ten toes or ten horns in the last days agree to give their assistance to the Antichrist. Because this Antichrist plus the ten horns of Revelation, which is the ten toes of Daniel, they are going to oppose Jesus Christ at the war of Armageddon. This is all in the future. Can't you imagine what the evening news is going to be like when all of this is happening? Can't you imagine what the newspapers are going to be printing when you get your morning newspaper? Of course, if you're a Christian, you won't be here then. But can't you imagine what's going to happen in the journalistic part of this world when they see these monumental things taking place that have been prophesied for literally thousands of years? The Bible is the only book that gives you the answer. It's the only book. None of the other books will give you the answer. The Bible. That's why it's necessary that you study your Bible. Study. To show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly, rightly dividing the word. Now notice what it says in verse 14. Verse 12 says that there's going to be 10 kings. Verse 13 says they're going to agree and give their power and strength unto the beast. Verse 14 says, these shall make war with the lamb. Kind of dumb, aren't they? <laughs> Imagine 10 nations in Europe opposing Jesus Christ, the Son of God. How crazy can governments be? Governments are only people. There's nothing supernatural about governments. Governments are people. And if you get a lunatic in government, you're going to have a lunatic government. If you get a mentally deficient person in government, you're going to have a mentally deficient government. There's no other way. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now drop down to the next to the last verse in chapter 17. Why will all of this happen? Here's the reason. Verse 17. For God hath put in their hearts, in the hearts of the rulers of the ten nations, the ten toes, the ten horns, God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. I don't know whether you believe it or not, but I believe that everything that's written in the Bible will come to pass exactly as it's written there. I hear people say, oh, those things are scary. Uh, those things were written thousands of years ago. They were written for another civilization. They don't have any bearing upon us. But I say that everything in the Bible has bearing upon us, and everything in the Bible that's prophesied will come to pass exactly as it's written. And one of those monumental things is that ten horns, ten toes, on the two feet of that image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream, those ten nations are going to give their power unto the Antichrist, and the Antichrist is going to attack Jesus Christ at the War of Armageddon and try to literally ruin him and interfere with God's plan, and it's an impossibility to stop God's plan. You can't do it. God's plan calls for the positioning of the, ten, of the 12 tribes of Israel in the land that God gave Abram in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. If these 10 boys here had their way, they would interfere with God's plan. 
The last part of the Bible would not come to pass. But God's word is positive. It's sure. There's no way you can offer it under any circumstances. Let's go a step further. Revelation 19. Looking at verses 11 through 15. And I saw heaven open. Now as heaven is open here, you look down on the ground and you see the ten horns of Revelation 17, the ten horn nations and the Antichrist and the false prophet. You see this great army gathered in the valley of Jezreel. You see the ships anchored in the Mediterranean Sea that have brought these soldiers from all over the world to fight this battle. And then all at once we see heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood and his name is called the word of God. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations and he should rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God and he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. <laughs> no ten horns going to defeat Jesus Christ. He's the King of Kings. And the Lord of Lords. Oh, there are other kings, but he's king of kings. There are other lords, but he's Lord of Lords. And the plan of God right down to the most minutest detail must come to pass exactly as it's written. Satan cannot alter it in any way. No way at all. Let's go back to the book of Daniel. Quite interesting, Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2. We're talking about the times of the Gentiles. We're talking about the time when the Gentiles would have had all of the opportunities they will ever have to be saved. We're talking about this great image that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream and he couldn't remember the image, but uh, Daniel remembered the image, and Daniel interpreted the image. And we see that it's just a simple little drawing, head of gold, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, thou art this head of gold, head of the Babylonian kingdom, Medes and the Persians, the silver arms, the brass, King Alexander, come on down to the two legs of iron, the Roman Empire, they dissipated and fell by the wayside. And then the ten toes, part iron, part clay. Meaning to say that iron and clay don't really stick together. But they stick together long enough to give their power and strength unto the Antichrist. And then those ten horns plus the Antichrist and the false prophet, don't forget him. He plays an integral part in this whole drama. In the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and long about uh, verse 11, somewhere in there, the Antichrist, the correction, the false prophet comes on the scene. He gets into the act and he's going to be at Armageddon. But notice what happens. This is Daniel chapter 2, looking at verse 44. And in the days of these kings... Now, most of the kings have all passed off the scene. Let's, let's get this in our minds first. This kingdom has passed off the scene. This one has passed off. The brass, the iron, uh, that's all passed off the scene. But now, in the days of these kings, these ten toes, notice what it says. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Christ's kingdom, God's kingdom, is going to stand forever. 
All of these kingdoms, Nebuchadnezzar, Medes and the Persians, Alexander of Brass, Roman Empire of Iron, the Ten Toes, part iron and clay, all of these kingdoms are going to pass off the scene. And the kingdom of God is going to stand forever. Verse 45, For as much as thou sawest that the stone, this should refer to Christ, it does, should be a capital S. The translators of the Bible didn't do it, but it should be. For as much as thou sawest that the stone, Christ, was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold, there is the grinding up of all of those chemical parts, mineral parts of that image. The gold, the silver, brass, the iron, the clay, the, the stone hit this image and is grinding them to powder. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure, positive, no chance of a mishap in any way. It'll come to pass exactly as the word of God says. Where's little Israel? Little Israel is in a piece of property in the Middle East. Well, actually, I can demonstrate it. Israel is in a little piece of property here. If I lay my finger over that property on this map, you can't see it. It's just a little tiny piece of real estate. You can drive from one end to the other in an automobile in less than a day. You can fly over it in less than an hour. Just a little tiny piece of property on the shores of the Mediterranean Sea. Where is Israel? She's there. Five million of them. And all of these nations of the earth are all mad at little Israel. But God's going to deal with all of these nations of the earth that are mad with little Israel because they are going to send representative armies to the war of Armageddon and Jesus Christ by the word of his mouth is just going to speak the command and literally millions and millions upon millions of soldiers will die at Armageddon. But Israel shall be saved out of all these troubles. According to the book of Romans chapter 11, verse 26. Israel shall be saved. And Israel is there today, fighting, almost bankrupt. Doesn't know from one day to the next where she'll get her next week of financing. A terrible condition under which to live. But don't forget for one moment that God has his eye upon little Israel. And the times of the Gentiles is almost up. And God is giving the Gentile nations of this earth a last opportunity to be saved. The voice is going out by television, by radio, domestic and foreign, by international shortwave, by printing presses, by missionaries combing the back roads of the countries of this world, trying to get the Gentiles of this world saved. And my friends, there are more people lost today than, any, than in any time in the history of this world. What are we doing? What are we doing? We're sitting back in our homes with all of our luxuries, and we're taking it easy, and we're enjoying ourselves, and we're saying in so many words, well, let them go to hell. Who cares? My friends, we need a great spiritual awakening down in our hearts and our souls because the souls of mankind are precious. God sent his son into this world to die on the cross of Calvary that we might have remission of sin and that Christ might become the atonement for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should receive everlasting eternal life. Have you received everlasting eternal life? 
Is there a place up in your memory? Is there a marker along the highway of life in your memory that you can go back and say, yes, there's the time that I received Christ as my Savior? Is there? There isn't? Why don't you? Why don't you receive Christ today? Why don't you in your own heart and in your own soul and in your own mind just make that commitment to God today and say, God, I want to receive your son into my heart. I want him to become my savior. I want him to become the ruler of my life and the king of my domain. Will you do that? Do it today and write me a letter. Just write me a little letter on a piece of paper. Does, you know, it could be crinkly or... Uh, soil paper, just cram it in a little envelope and send it off to me here at Colton, California. Encourage my heart that you have become a child of God this day. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, t'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. Sure.